I want to, I just want to say this before we, uh, we head into this. These are exciting days. God is exciting. <clears throat> He's turning us on through his word. It's Brother Copeland is setting the pace as, uh, as, uh, for this great believers convention, talking about what God did for us through Jesus on the cross, what Jesus Christ is doing for us at the right hand of the Father, what the Holy Spirit is doing in us through the Word. And last night, preaching one of the masterpiece messages that we've heard, any of us, on what happened from the cross to the throne, our Lord and Savior, Deliverer, Redeemer, <clears throat> that set it up for us. Now God is working, and the fact that people are here from so many countries and so many states is marvelous. This morning we've been together with Brother Copeland in five broadcasts uh, talking about the unity of the body of Christ, and it all fits together so beautifully. I haven't heard the roll call today, but I think some more countries are arriving. I heard Leslie Hale got here from Ireland. You here? Well, uh, 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 there he is. Well, st stand up. Let me see if you look all right. Over there in that country where they've been fighting for 14 years, you and Maureen, and you look like you've come through and you're big enough to take it, you know, the devil just about stole that. They're leading the greatest charismatic work in Europe. Did you know that? Tremendous in England and Ireland. And uh, they got a lot of property over there, and the devil tried to steal it because uh, they got a little behind on some payments, and they needed 300,000 property worth a million, or uh, maybe on normal market, maybe a couple of million. But they needed 300,000, and, and uh, where are they going to get it? But American Christians wanted to help them out, and uh, John Osteen was God's man, and, and between him and a man by the name of Milt something, Brother Milt, <laughs> I can't say that last German name, down there in John's church, 300,000 was raised there, and among other friends, and a big part of it borrowed from the bank that will be paid back but they've flown over there, and the property in North Ireland, bless God, is firmly in the hands of believers. And don't you forget it. And I just urge you preachers to get acquainted with Leslie Hale. Try to get him at your meetings or whatever important event you have. Get him in it and turn him on and then go over to Ireland and do like I did. Days and I are going over. Hey, why don't you come and go with us? The 18th, 19th, and 20th, we'll be in Ireland making the devil mad. Right there, blessing property that the devil wanted to steal and didn't get to because T.L. and Daisy cared and John and Dodie cared and, and Milt and his wife cared and bless God, some more people cared. Isn't that the body of Christ working together? We're talking about nations. Brother Copeland, I've been touched. He's burdened for cities. He talks cities. He talks nations. He talks the world. God's men have to be world men, nation men, city men. He's talking about Atlanta becoming the city of love, no longer the lawless city. And he says, it's, we're going to come into Atlanta one of these days. There's going to be big signs that says, Welcome to Atlanta, the city of love. You believe that'll happen? You can bet your life on it. I, I love him because he's a big thinker. He thinks world. He was praying last night, claiming, casting down the devil of war over the Falklands. Now I look for a settlement because we prayed last night. He talked about going to Israel on the front lines, commanded the devil of hate to stop, and they got a ceasefire the next day. Just happenstance? I don't know. I, th I don't think so. I think Jesus' name had something to do with it. And I was in Europe now. I believe in taking nations. That's why for some years 
days that have been determined the French nation of the world that's known for her cultural glory throughout the ages and they're a bunch of snobs and proud of that and I say once again the cloud of God's glory is going to come over French but it won't be a cultural glory it's going to be a glory in soul winning and in lifting up the name of Jesus we got so mad about that deal that we just learned the language, the language of French. And maintenant nous prêchons français afin de pouvoir évangéliser le monde francophone. Combien ici croire que nous devons les donner l'occasion de recevoir Jésus-Christ? Dites Amen. Merci Jésus, il y a quelques-uns qui me comprennent. Gloire à Dieu. Amen. And we need to do that. You know what I said. Hallelujah. And I just got so turned on him believing that. And I thought, boy, he's right on. My spirit witnesses with his spirit. He's praying for the Falklands and Argentina and Great Britain. And, 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 and I like what he said, that the devil's trying to build hatred because God has got revival, spiritual awakenings pegged for those nations. May God out of this save England and save Argentina. Ain't that fun to get to be in on big things? That's why when I was over in Europe, God spoke to me. I've never done anything like this in my life. Hey, this ain't the sermon. This is good stuff, but the sermon's going to be better. I, I never done not, nothing like this in my life. But you know what? God spoke to me. I didn't even know Leslie was in trouble up there in Ireland. God said to me, hey, son, you believe God leads these people? You know, men of God are something. We can change countries. The Lord said, don't you fly right back to America. You go to Ireland. Lift up Leslie Hale's hands. Stand on Irish soil and pray for Ireland. I did that. I had our secretary call him from America and say, would you like that? And of course he uh, pretty near come unglued. He didn't know I'd come up there. And uh, we went up there, and I'll tell you, we was a nuisance to the devil all the time we was up there. Uh, I menaced him, a problem to him. Wonderful things happened, but little did I know. He didn't even tell me yet uh, what was happening, how that bank was trying to take all their property. And I come home and finally found out about it, and then John Osteen got in on it. And look, look what happened. Now today, uh, you know, there's a couple of hundred thousand got to be paid back, but that ain't nothing. You got a little bit of time to do that. That's easy. God's got lots of that. But that bank wanted to get it when he didn't have it. See? But they didn't get it. Hallelujah. <clears throat> because of Brother Milt, God bless Brother Milt. I don't know where he's at. Where you at, Brother Milt? Stand up, Brother Milt. I love you because you saved Ireland. Now I try and get him and his wife, go with me and Daisy over there the 18th, 19th, and 20th, and just grin at it. Say, I helped save it. And just be over there and just, just be there and let the devil kind of fidget. I, I'm, unless I'm tickled. You can let me come over there them three days. Norval Hayes got all stirred up. He said, I'm going to take a bunch of our Bible school students. We're going to go over there and just put on a campaign going from door to door, casting out devils and healing the sick and getting people saved. <laughs> and you know what that is? That's the kingdom in operation. We can't sit around and suck our thumb while the devil takes over countries and we can do something about it. We can do something about it. You believe that? I just think that's wonderful. Hallelujah. So, Leslie, more power to you. Stand up again. You look so good. Let me look at you again. You let the devil know you're alive. Wave your hand a little bit more. Both of them. Put both of them up. Like two flags. Hallelujah. Get acquainted with it. I love to do things like that. Boy, the devil gets nervous when we look at a country. You know, I've always said, when Daisy and me get off an airplane, walk across the tarmac, of course, usually it's not us together. She, usually she's already been there, and I'm walking across to meet her. She set it up and met the heads of states and all the preachers and everything. But sometimes we get to go together, not often. When we do, or whether it's me alone, you know, she'll always come out to meet me, and we go arm and arm and arm together anyhow, just as soon as we can, because we're sweethearts. She'll come a-running. I like it that way. We've been married just 40 years, but we're just as sweethearty as ever. We kind of flaunt that in this day where so many people is busting up. But when we do that, walk across the tarmac, go into a city, I just feel so nice about it. And I just walk as tall as I can. 
and kind of take extra long steps. Because I know the cameramen, the newspapers, all there taking pictures, I just put it on, just, just really act it out. Because I just feel like I'm king. I just come to take over. I walk a little extra nice just to make the devil fidgety. I'm coming in, he's backing off. Bless God. Amen. Said the devil's been after me all day, not me. I'm after him all the time. When T.L. and Daisy get there, he's got a problem. Hallelujah. That's why we recorded that tape, the unbeatable, God's unbeatable husband-wife team. You can't beat a husband-wife hooked together like glory and kin. Adam and Eve didn't have nothing on us, did they? Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Charles and Peggy. Ain't that pretty? <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> John and Dodie. It just rings. Ken and glory. Isn't that a beautiful word? It fits together. <clears throat> We've talked to you. We're talking to you about the gospel. We've come to share with you. Uh, Brother Copeland has set the pace. Brother Sutton comes along and gives, is giving the prophetic side of it and a lot of practical side of it. Cap, Brother Charles Capps coming along sharing with us the kingdom aspect of the gospel. Marvelous study that Brother Capps gave yesterday. I'll tell you, that's, I don't know if there's a greater message than the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Brother Osteen is in a series of of, of the gospel of miracles for earth's failures. Talking about who we are in Christ, what Christ has done for us, uh, uh, what rights and privileges we have in Christ, and what I can do through him. Boy, you get all that hooked up together in the gospel. It's wonderful. And then I told you yesterday, we've come as a, a witness to you that this gospel that we preach works all over the world. Daisy and I have been privileged to proclaim the gospel in the open air, in, fe on, in fields and parks and stadiums, to almost never less than 20,000, 15, 20,000 to 50,000, 100,000, 150,000, 200,000, up to 250,000 people. For in, in almost 70 countries, during, um, during over 34 years, now that's a lot of years and a lot of countries, doing this before multitudes of people of practically all of the major religions of the world, and to this day, we have not yet seen anything that even hinted of a failure. I say you're bragging. No. And you know, we first went to Jamaica, then went to Puerto Rico, then arrived in Cuba. And the Cuban missionaries of medicine said, now, brother and sister Osborne, you must be humble. They heard about these great victories and triumphs in Jamaica and Puerto Rico. And they said, you can't expect it to always be that way. Well, I mean, we were just... Uh, doing what it said and so we couldn't be we couldn't brag a lot about it we didn't want to flaunt it we were young but it didn't see me like they were right they didn't spook me but they were working on us being humble away back then and i guess they'd still want us to humble ourselves and flop and i ain't willing to i don't believe god sponsors no flops i don't believe in flopping i don't i believe the gospel is designed for every people under heaven and if we will announce it, it is the power of God. And in, in all these nations, not to this day have we seen an exception. Now that's a good testimony. That should encourage you. That isn't T.L. up here bragging, boy, look at us. We're the, we're the whiz-bang, blowy evangelistic team that can always make it work. That's not the point. The point is the gospel. This 
gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, announced, proclaimed with evidence. You got to have that. But this gospel of the kingdom will produce evidence if you preach this gospel of the kingdom. When you preach the gospel, the real gospel, you don't have to pray for miracles. Miracles take place. When you sow wheat seed, you don't have to pray for wheat. In fact, you can pray your head off and can't keep wheat from coming up if you sow wheat. You put good eggs to hatch and turn the heat on, you don't have to pray for chickens. You can pray your head off and fast 21 days and you can't keep them chickens from coming out of them eggs if they're good eggs. And when you preach the gospel of the kingdom, miracles are the outgrowth of that because this gospel of the kingdom is Jesus. Jesus is a miracle, Jesus. His birth was a miracle, his conception was a miracle, his coming is a miracle, his life a miracle, his ministry a miracle, death a miracle, resurrection a miracle, and Copeland preached last night all the miracles happened between, between the, the, the cross and the throne, all those miracles, and Pentecost came in a miracle, and the true church of Jesus Christ is a series, an unfolding of supernatural happenings and, and, and miracles, and it'll go on like that, and I am involved in miracles. Are you? I love what Catherine Kuhlman always said, and I say it a lot, and I hear a lot of preachers say, I believe in miracles because I believe in God. You think you can hem God up in the corner and cut that miracle power off and say it's done away with? Ah, you just well preach God is dead. <clears throat> God ain't dead. And miracles haven't stopped. So, in announcing this gospel, I went as a foundation for my part in this great believers' convention here with Brother and Sister Copeland. To 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, I declare unto you the gospel. What is it? How that Christ died, how that he was buried, how that he rose, and how he has been seen. And he was seen of a lot of people. And I told you yesterday that I got to see him too. Paul saw him. Cephas saw him. James, the head of the church, saw him. 500 brethren at one time saw him. A lot of other people saw him. Mary saw him. A hundred Buddhists down in southern Thailand saw him at one time in our meetings. I saw him. He came into my room. And I give witness to you today that the gospel works. And we are here to share this wonderful gospel with you this afternoon. And so... Uh, I will, I've, been, I've been sharing with you these ideas since this is the gospel. Since Jesus died, was buried, rose, and was seen, this makes the difference. The Christian message depends on whether or not Jesus is risen from the dead. So, Yesterday we asked question number one, is Jesus Christ alive? Everybody knows he once lived. Does he live now? I say yes, and I gave my witness yesterday why I say yes. Question number two, how can we be sure that he's alive from the dead again? Let him do again the things that he did before they killed him, and we'll know. Every crusade we've ever conducted, opening the first night, we preach on Je uh, Hebrews 13 and 8. Quote it together. Jesus Christ is the same. Say it. Come on louder. Yesterday. 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 One more time. Jesus. Yesterday. Today and forever. The first meeting of every crusade I've ever preached, I've preached on that sermon, because to me, the issue at stake in the Christian message among the non-Christians is that, is Jesus alive? Can we be sure? And so I tell them all 
about the ministry of Jesus. How he healed the sick, how he raised the dead, how he opened the ears of the deaf and the blinded eyes and the crippled legs were healed, sins were forgiven, sad people were made happy, down people were lifted up, sick people were cured. All of these good things, how he taught a message of love and of kindness. But religions, bigots, prejudiced people never stopped until they dogged his trail and nagged at him and until they finally held kind of a kangaroo court and got him condemned because he was talking about making a, 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 that God was his father, some things that was too holy for them to contemplate, and they finally ended up crucifying him, thinking that they got rid of this rabble rouser, not knowing they were fulfilling the prophets and fulfilling and 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 uh, and fulfilling all that was required in the gospel, the good news not knowing that God created us in the beginning well and happy and sinless and perfect. Then Satan came, got us to doubt God's word. Then sin came, driven out in the presence of God. Sin and sickness followed all the generations since then. But God wasn't happy because God is love and he didn't want us to die. He said the soul that sinneth shall die. But if everybody, everybody had to die, for, if everybody paid for their own sin, everybody would have to die. God is not willing that any should perish. One of the scriptures, I think, Brother Sutton opened his... Uh, message yesterday with God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance had to figure out a way to save us from dying because his own law said if we sin we die we'd all sin we'd all die and he figured out a way Jesus sinless his son perfect no sin no stain hallelujah came as our substitute died on the cross for us bore our sins for us suffered our diseases for us took our place for us answered for us I ought to have been crucified, but I wasn't, he was. You should have been crucified, but you weren't, he was, in your place. And the message of the gospel is that, to tell the world that since he did it for us, we don't have to. And now the good news of the gospel is to go tell that to the world, tell everybody, Jesus paid the price, he bore your sin, he bore your sickness, all you got to do is believe it, accept it, and that's the gospel, and the gospel is the power that will convert you, make you new, heal you, make you happy, make you prosperous. It will all happen when you accept the gospel, and the kingdom goes to work in you through Jesus. Hallelujah. So that's, that's just a, a little quick wrap-up of what the gospel is in as simple terms as you can put it out. And so, so uh, it's important that we know, though, that this Jesus did raise from the dead. So that's every night, the first night, that's what we talk about. And we preach all that to the people and explain it all. Now, most of them have never heard anything like that in their life. It's kind of lonesome on a platform like that. You know, it's nice uh, to come out here. Uh, yesterday they said some nice things about me when I walked out here. And uh, a lot of times in America we go preach and they say all these nice things and where we've been, the people all stand up and clap and applaud. And that just blesses my ego. Everybody likes to be bragged on, you know. I love to walk out there and all the people applauding and saying, great T.L., here he is. Boy, let's listen. Going to be good. Makes you feel good. But, you know, uh, the reason I enjoy it, I can kind of live it up because uh, Daisy and I have spent our life where it didn't work that way. You walk out on an old crude platform out on a dusty field where there's 50 or 100,000 people that never heard of you before and you're a foreigner, that's against you to start with, and you're coming over there to preach a foreign religion, they think, and that's against you, and you come out there, all them people there, witch doctors trying to th throw spells on you and uh, maniacs there and, and, and women and with little kids that are squalling and screaming and blind people and, and lepers with stumps for arms and uh, toes gone, maybe their nose gone, their ears gone. Out there you see people with smallpox, these contagious diseases, maybe an epileptic fit or two going on and you walk out, boy, they don't care where you've been. They ain't interested in that. You're a foreigner. They're not sure they want you there. And they got plenty of their breed there to put a spell on you to run you out of town if you don't do something good like you said you was going to do. And you walk up there, boy, there ain't no hand clapping. It's lonesome. <laughs> you better have something. And my little 96-pound Daisy is the one that has to go first. Better her than me, mate. They're going to get it. I'm... 
I'm like them disciples after <laughs> the crucifixion. Boy, I stay behind locked doors until Daisy goes out there, them women, and sees how that thing will work. If they get by and their hide's safe, then we can come out there, you know. <laughs> but she goes out there and tells them, what, makes a few little simple statements, uh, not like the preliminaries at a, at a Ken Copeland meeting you know, <laughs> and tells them what we're there for, and then I come up. So you see, when you, when you walk out there like that, there's one thing you better do. You better be able to produce what you talk about. <clears throat> old Daddy Johnson, the old Methodist, told me when I was 25, he was 75, he said, Osborne, he smacked his lips, he said, always preach truth. said, truth will always demonstrate. <laughs> and then he would add, if you can't demonstrate it, you ain't fit to preach it. That's heavy. That's heavy. But that's the truth. Now, when you've been for 34 years out there, uh, 33 years out there, we've been home about a year now, and, and you face crowds like that, you learn the value of the gospel. And you stand up there the first night, you've got to deal with the issue. Is this Jesus we're talking about alive or dead? So I make that whole sermon, tell that whole story, and then I get ready just when all the preachers are ready for me to bring in the net, get them all converted. And I always just stop, and it always shocks everybody. I say, now, I come out here as a preacher of the gospel, and what I'm here for is to get you to decide for this Jesus Christ, let him come into your life, because according to this little Bible I carry with me, Jesus is the only one, the only way to heaven, the only way for you to ever be saved, the only way for you to ever find God. There's no other way. I'm not here to differ with anybody about any religion, but according to this, I come to preach, preach what I have learned about God. Not to fuss with anybody, but I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, he's the only way. But... I can't ask you to believe on this Jesus. Here I am, a foreigner in a strange country to me, working with an interpreter, a strange language. I don't ask you to believe on this Jesus just because I've made it sound important. And then I, that, that always gets them right in my hand. I say, let us see if Jesus is unchanged today. And then I always say this, I always beat them to the draw. The point... Uh, Brother uh, Amberger, uh, Brother Amberger, uh, Blaine, you were down there. You saw that, didn't you? Was, did you get in on an opening night? The second night. Well, we'd already done this opening night. But boy, it's fun, ain't it? <clears throat> yeah. Oceans of people look like. But I always tell them, I don't ask you to believe what I've said until first, let's see if he's alive. Now, if he's alive and as good as I've told you, I think you'll want to receive him. But I want you to know, don't just take my word for it. So I say, what we'll do, I think it's reasonable to you people, let this Jesus that I've come to talk to you about do among you the kind of things that he did before they crucified him. Now if he can do it, he must be alive. If he's dead, he can't do anything. His name will have no power. But if he does it, when we pray to God using his name like he told us to do, then you will know that all the rest in that book is true and that his blood was shed for you. He's the only Savior. He died on the cross for you. He lives today. And then you can make an intelligent uh, decision and receive him as your Savior and Lord. You can be converted and you can go to heaven. You can have Jesus in your life. You can be healed. All the good things that come with it. Now, is that a good deal? And they're always just as quiet as a pin because they never heard anybody in their life talk like that. And, and I tell them, I say, uh, sometimes you're know, just kind of uh, uh, accentuated a little bit. I tell him, I say, now, if he won't, well, then you would know that I'm a false teacher. Then you could run me out of town. I, I don't deserve the honor that your country has given me and the trust to stand up here in, in this country where I'm not a citizen, I'm just a visitor by the courtesy of your country that gave me a visit, a visa. I don't deserve the courtesy to stand up here and influence this field of 50,000 people if I'm false. 
I'm here to tell you Jesus is good. God is love. He wants to save you. He wants to bless you. But I don't deserve the honor of you listening to me if that isn't the truth. Now that puts them right in your hand. And then what we always do, we tell them we're going to pray to God according to this little book I carry in my hand. And if God will answer that prayer, when we pray in the name of Jesus, His Son, who made this all possible, then we would be able to say, oh, that works. That must be okay. That must be the way it is. And you'll see them kind of nodding their head. I don't care whether it's Muslims, Shintoists, fetish worshipers, I don't care what kind of religion, when you present it that way, they'll listen. If we could do that in Israel today, they won't let us go in the open in Israel. I wish they'd wake up over there and give us some liberty. Preach this, Jesus, but they're spooked. They're scared. They're, they're nice people. We love them all, but that's why I don't go over there. They won't let me preach in the open air. I'm mad at them. I want to, I want to preach in the open air. I won't go. Let me preach in the open air. I'll come. But I don't want no censorship. See? So then I, we pray. They said, I have a prayer. And I tell them, we're going to pray. And then after we pray, we just pray for everybody. And then, and then if, if, if Jesus comes and does some of those wonderful things to you that nobody here can do, let it be things that nobody can do. Let us see if any witch doctor here can do it. Let us see if there's any priestess of any other religion or any priest of any other religion that can do it. If there's any uh, a soothsayer here that can do it, anybody here from any religion that can do what we do, then we'll know that this that I'm talking is no better than, 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 than witchcraft or anything else. That seems to be a good deal. And then we pray that prayer. Now, I've had preachers all over the world say, Osborne, you shouldn't do that. You put God on the spot. You tempt God. And, of course, I'll always go ahead and tell them. I'll say, now, we're going to pray this prayer, and if nothing happens, then you run us out of town. Sometimes, if I feel this preacher a little spooky just to play with them, I've got kind of a mean streak in me. And I'll say, I'll say, well, just chase the preachers out with me. They don't want me to say that, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> just run us out. Tell us all... Uh, Quit our churches, turn them into business houses, do something good for the country if we're a bunch of deceivers. And then people say, you, you, you tempt God, you put God on the spot. No, I think God's sitting up there clapping his hands and saying, whoopee, somebody at last is telling it like it is. Amen. Amen. I believe that. What are we trying to prove? That Jesus is the Son of God, risen from the dead according to the Scriptures, and that He loves you and wants to give you life abundant. You think God's not interested in that? That's what God's interested in. We can get ever so theological and ever so technical about our doctrine, but when you boil it down, what we're talking about is the gospel for the common people, so that the people don't have to hurt anymore so they don't have to suffer anymore, so they don't have to have a guilty conscience anymore, so they don't have to go kill somebody, so they don't have to avenge themselves, so they can be at peace. That's what the gospel's for, to reach the people that are hurting. The world out there is hurting. They're hurting all over the world with the same hurts, the same fears, the same diseases. God's interested in them. And we always pray that prayer. Then when we finish praying that prayer, just a simple prayer, because, I, you know, I think, I think that prayer must be, that must have God's attention. If there's any prayers at a better time, that must be the best time, the best circumstances. God must really perk up and listen close to that one, you know. I'm sure he, that's not true. He listens to all of them. We pray in Jesus' name, no difference. But I say if there's any special time, that would be it when you're praying to him to show that Jesus is alive before a multitude of people that sincerely don't know if he's anything more than just a religion. And so that's what we do and pray. And after through, then uh, we, just, we just say now, uh, you, that, uh, you that, were, that had something happen, like that, that's absolutely supernatural. No witch doctor in the country can do it. I want you to uh, uh, tell us, and it never fails. Never fails. They're there. It always happens. Always comes to pass. Because God is more interested in that than almost anything else in this world. 
that a field of people all at once know that Jesus is the Son of God risen from the dead. And when they come up there, and always in a few minutes, the platform will get packed. They'll just pack it with people coming up there. Pagan people never heard the gospel get healed. They come running up there, blind people, all sorts of things. They run up there, and as they stand there, then I'll, I'll have a few of them. Where Daisy will find a few special ones and bring them there and show the people what God done and get their names, let the people hear that. Now, do you know what that does to a crowd of people? And they hear that. And then I always turn, every one of them, I say, now, is it true? Is it true? And then about three or four of them, real good ones, then I'll turn to them and say, now, you've heard enough. You've heard enough. Now, I want to ask you a question. Is Jesus Christ the Son of the living God? Is he risen from the dead, or is he still dead? How did he do these things? How can we explain it? Since it's so, how many here want now to say, Brother Osborne, I want to receive the Jesus you've come to my country to preach about. I want to receive him. I want to become his follower his disciple and start believing the Bible and read it I will become a Christian in my country I want this life from God through Jesus how many will do it and I've never yet seen a field of people no matter how big no matter what country no matter what religion I've never seen yet anybody that didn't raise their hand a hundred thousand fifty thousand now, I'm not, uh, there may have been some there that didn't. When there's a feel like that, you can't see everybody, but it always looks like everybody says, I want it. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us. <clears throat> My third question was going to be, what does it mean if Jesus is risen from the dead and we can prove it? Okay. It means... When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead... The priests got together and said, hey, we got to kill him. What they do that for when he'd done such a good thing? What does it mean? They said, the whole world will follow him. We got to kill him. That's what it means. What does it mean? It means the world will follow Jesus. It means millions will turn to Jesus if they can see the evidence that he is alive today. That's our mission. To be proof producers of the resurrection. I say that in America. I've said that a little strong today. I'm sorry if I've offended you. I don't mean to offend you, but I've dealt with these masses until, to me, that's the issue. Is this a dead religion? Or is Jesus really, sure enough, alive? If he's alive, then look out. Hallelujah. Example. Example. I attended a pagan wedding in, in Benin City, Nigeria. They had married a little 12-year-old girl to an old fellow that already had a harem of wives. She's just another one added to the harem. Well, it was a terrible thing they put that little girl through. It touched me, but I was there as a guest, and, and those things affect you and help you reach out to the people, see. Well, when it was all over, I stayed behind. A few people hung around because the old mammy, the old mama, the old, witch, uh, the old uh, priestess, the old uh, witch is what she was, blurry-eyed, mean-looking, bulge eyes, kind of fat and flabby and, and just mean. She could talk a little pigeon English, and I'll tell you, that old, that old mother, she ramrodded everything around her. She was boss, I mean. She would go to sit down, servants run, put a little stool under her. So she was it. And so I, I sat around, I wanted to talk to old mama. And so we, we uh, warmed up to the subject, and I said, Mama, I want to ask you a question. Do you believe the Bible here? Are you crazy? You think you think we're pagan? She read me like a book. That's exactly what I thought. You think we're pagan? Of course we have our Bibles. We have our churches. We're not pagan. I said, do you believe in miracles? You believe Jesus does miracles? He did in the Bible. You believe he does today? No. Do you believe in juju? She come right back at me. 
Oh, she just, those old mean eyes fired up. She was coming in for the kill to make a convert. You believe in juju? I said, no. Oh, juju's great. You don't know how great juju? No, I don't know. Juju's greater than a caterpillar, she said. Caterpillar tractor. That's a funny, a funny uh, uh, illustration. That's what she said. I guess she'd seen some big tractor, and that just seemed to be the biggest thing she ever saw. And she blurted that out. Juju's stronger than a caterpillar tractor, she said. Just, just, and in her pigeon English, is really funny how it come out. And I stayed respectful, hung right in there. I said, Mama, I said, no, I don't believe in it. I said, oh, that, that, that church over there appointed the steeple. I said, don't they have miracles over there? She said, white man, you ask crazy questions. They don't have miracles over there. I said, now, Mama, wait a minute. If you get sick or if your child gets sick, wouldn't you take your child over to that preacher over there? Would that missionary or that preacher, wouldn't he pray for a child? Wouldn't they be healed? She said, white man. And she pointed, her old arm flopping down here. She pointed, she said, white man, that preacher don't believe in his God like we believe in Juju. I said, Mama, one of these days, you're going to see lights turned on over there in that big, that big field, that big park. You're going to see a platform being erected, big horns, speaker horns. You're going to see a white preacher over there, and that's going to be me. And I said, when that happens, I'm going to have my Bible, and I'm going to be preaching about Jesus. And, and I'm going to be telling the people about Jesus, because I said, Mama, he does the same things today as he did in Bible days. I said, when I come, I want you to go find all the blind people, all the deaf people, all the maniacs, all the lepers, all the critical, crip, all the... Anybody you can find, all the cripples, I want you to bring them to that crusade. Let them hear me talk about Jesus. And if they'll hear me talk about Jesus, you'll see them get healed. Jesus will come and heal them. It'll be wonderful, Mama. And I had her attention. She was swimming with me. You know, those old blurry eyes. Oh, the, I keep talking about those old blurry eyes. You ought to look in them eyes. I'll tell you, they, were, they, they didn't look like human eyes. I mean, those eyes were something else. And that old woman, and she was, she was right with me, carried away with that. And I said, Mama, when that happens, what do you think people do? And she's leaned over on that stool with her legs out here and her belly hanging in between. I mean, just to head on with me. And I was giving her just like that. We just squatted down that African style going after it. And she said, white man, if you do that, we will burn all of our juju gods and we will follow your Jesus. That's what she said. Hallelujah. What does it mean if Jesus is risen from the dead and the world really finds out about it? That's what it means. There's no hard cases. Muslims hard to win. Never. Not when they find out Jesus is alive. Fourth question. How does it affect me if Jesus is risen from the dead? I'll tell you how it affects you. John 14, 19. Because... He lives. I live also. With the same kind of life. Now that's very simple. That's what Charles Capp's talking about. That's what Kenneth Copeland's talking about. We have him in us. Christianity, the only form of worship. It's not a religion. The only form of worship in which the object worship dwells in the heart of the worshiper. Hallelujah. Jesus, whom we love, sets up headquarters in our bosom. Hallelujah in our spirit. A Muslim never claimed that Muhammad lived in him. No Hindu ever claimed that the deity he worships lives in him. It would be sacrilegious, perish the thought. Yet we Christians strut the Jesus we worship makes our house his headquarters. That's Christianity. <laughs> Hallelujah. How does it affect me if he's risen from the dead? Is he alive? Yes. How can we be sure? Let him do what he did before they killed him. 
What does it mean? The whole world will follow him. How does it affect me? I live and become just like him. So, the ultimate question of this study today is, are you alive? He is, are you? Have you found him? Most human beings are already dead. In one way or another, they have lost their dreams, their ambition, their desire for a better life. They have surrendered their fight for self-esteem. They have compromised their potential. They have settled for mediocrity. They have settled for despair. They have settled for nights of terror and tears. They are dead while they live. They are boxed in their negative world. They have chosen to give up. They have chosen to die when they could choose life. They can expect, you can expect, the greatest miracle in the world. You can come back from the dead like Jesus did. That's what the Christian message means. Jesus is alive, and because he lives, you can live too. That's our message to the world. That's what we are witnesses of. What do I mean by the prize of being alive? I mean, alive. The first letter in it is A. I'll give you the outline. I can't give you the message because the time is almost gone. But I'll give you the outline. You can get it later. We'll be doing the whole thing on tape and you'll know about it. But you can dream from the outline. It means if Jesus came back from the, from the realm of captivity, from the grave, that Kenneth Copeland preached about last night. If he's come back again, then it means I am A, alive, A, accepted. I am accepted. Hear me, if you are here, if you are us, if you have been a sinner, if you have not believed on Jesus, it means when Jesus came back, you are accepted. Because when Jesus arose, he put off my sins, he settled my affair, he opened the way for me to come back to God. Romans 4.25, Romans 5.1, Romans 8.1, Colossians 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, Ephesians 2.5 and 6, Ephesians 1 and 6, I am accepted by God. You didn't bat an eye on that. You're not an outcast anymore. You're not a sinner anymore when you hear that. You're not lost anymore when you hear that. You're not a nobody anymore when you hear that. You're accepted. You are accepted. Right now, your sins, which were many, are forgiven. They were forgiven when Jesus rose from the dead. I'm telling you about it. Believe it and receive eternal life in you. I am accepted. Wonderful acceptance. When I think of being accepted by God, I can be accepted by people. I won't run around with a chip on my shoulder anymore. That's a, this is a big sermon that I couldn't even dare get close to. But I'll be accepted of myself and quit hating myself. People, nobody.
society hates someone else. That's always a smoke screen. When you act as though you hate someone else, it's because it's you that you really hate. Get off of that. Discover what Jesus did for you between the cross and the throne. And that when he come alive, you came alive with him. And you are accepted. People who are mean and rebellious and tearing up other people's property and derogatory and condemning people and blurting out pieces of their mind, ugliness, hatred, bigotry, prejudice, all is a cover-up for the ugly self that you see. I don't see it, God don't see it, you see it in you. You have an ugly picture of yourself and you are trying to take it out on other people. Fall in love with yourself. and you'll be good and nice to other people. I'm like Brother Osteen, he gets the mirror and looks in and says, who would you like to preach? He says, me. <clears throat> I tell you, you're accepted. I don't care how many bad things you've done. God accepts you, not because you're acceptable, but because Jesus is acceptable. Jesus was accepted. His covenant was accepted. His blood was accepted. And when you identify with Jesus, I love what Brother Copeland said, then God's got to accept you because he already agreed on the deal. I'm just riding on Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm with him. I haven't got nothing of my own, but everything he's got's mine. And that's enough. I love to tell people when I make altar calls. Two words I love to use, and I just usually use them and use them and use them and use them over and over. I love to te tell people after they've accepted Christ, then I say, trust, trust, trust. Just trust now. Trust what? Trust that he did enough. And that's the other word I like to stress. Enough. He did enough. I don't need to do anything else about it. There's not a thing I can do to, to, to make this deal any better. Trust that Jesus did enough. Do you trust that he did enough today to accept you? Hey, I am accepted. Alive. What does it mean to be alive? Oh, I am loved. Anytime I question my own value, I stop, lift up my head, stand straight as though in a stance of salute and look away to the cross of Jesus Christ and say, that's what I'm worth. Let me never put down what God paid so much to pick up. Let me never condemn what God paid so much to redeem. Let me agree with God. If he thinks I'm worth that much, I do too. I'm okay by his grace. I'll never grovel again. Not in my own privacy nor on stage. I am hooked up with God. The proof yonder on that hill, Jesus did it all for me. He did enough. I trust that. That's enough. All I'll do is just identify. Copeland preached it last night from A to Z. God in heaven has 
is my record. My record shows I was crucified. I died. I was buried. I rose and I'm okay. I'm in Jesus. I'm with him, seated with him in the throne room. Hallelujah. Because of what's been done. I am accepted. L. I am loved. I alive. A L I. I am inspired. Wow. Romans 8 11. Ephesians 1 16 to 23. I am ex inspired. Like the disciples at the cross, they were gloomy, but resurrection morning they took off running Peter and John. Let's see this thing. Like the woman at the well convinced Jesus is a Christ, she forgot her water pots, went off to get the town. Me too. Daisy and me been running our legs off all over the world. 33, 34 years, we're inspired. Said we never saw you discouraged. We never see you, but you don't turn us on. Why not? We're inspired. Why? We know that what Copeland preached last night is the truth. Jesus settled it all, and when he came forth, look out, devil, look out, we'll back off, everybody. We're coming through. We're the king's elite. I'm inspired. A L I inspired V I am valued. <laughs> A price was paid for me. E to wrap it up. You gotta hold your chair. Wow. I am engaged. Don't, don't get in my way. I am busy. Because I have got good news and a lot of people to tell it to. I'm busy. I'm engaged. I'm alive. My friends, you who are praying for God to give you a ministry, discover Jesus is alive. And you'll get so turned on that the world, your neighborhood, will beat a new path to your front door to talk to somebody that makes them feel good. Hallelujah. They've come from the four corners of this country and from across the seas, converging on the city of love. Atlanta, for the murdered devil has been trumped on. It shows how far people will travel, how much they'll pay to go find somebody that will lift them and make them feel good about their identity with God. Nobody will do this and run off to a bunch of denominational uh, 16th century theologians that's going to pound you over the head and paint God with a white beard and a big piece of, uh, a big blackboard and a mean hunk of chalk and a club in his hand. And if he ain't rapping you on the head for one thing, he's marking it down, going to get you for it later. Nobody will go listen to that. Let me have any crowd of 50 or 75 or 100,000 people that come everywhere we go. Let me take any crowd like that and let me preach four nights in a row like a lot of preachers preach to people over here. I won't have any more on the fifth night than some of the preachers have. People don't want to be finger poked at. That's always a cover up. A preacher's got a problem. We got good news. We lifting people. God ain't mad at nobody. God loves you. He has good news and sent us to tell you about it. And I want you to know you are engaged. You can do things. You can do things. Do you believe that?